D&D Stories is inspired by Noah and Twyler's series Counter Monkey. While imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, I did thankfully carve out my own identity over time. People seemed to enjoy the stories I brought to the internet, so I just kept setting up my camera and talking to it. So long as I have tabletop games to play in, there will always be D&D Stories. Hello and welcome to another D&D Stories. I am your host, T the Writer, and this is the show where we sit here and I regale you with all the tabletop gaming stories and remember when something cool happened. So, we come up to a new campaign today called Goddess Wheel, and if you've been following me since episode one, you know this is a, a really, really long adventure that has spanned over several campaigns and, you know, the world has broken down into one remaining tectonic plate and all the rest is gone. Um, there are mysterious forces eating away at the underbelly of the world. The gods are gone. The woman who led the people from the point the gods left is gone also, as are her children. And, you know, the island is shrinking, so what more can we do? but try to leave or try to save the world. So, what's going to happen? Let's find out. When I started uh, Goddess Wheel, I was very into uh, World of Warcraft, like unhealthily so. So if you need to imagine the area that this campaign takes place in, just imagine Silithus. Um... It was a place that was like, it had Egyptian-style ruins. It was gray, uninteresting landscapes with rolling, jagged uh, rocks everywhere. It was filled with cultists and giant bugs and scorpions and other nastiness out there. But the main group of, of bad guys were called the Silithid. They were world-eating, scarab people insects that would... Uh, you know, they just teamed through the whole place, through tunnels, through uh, a raid encounter. There, were, Like I said, there were cultists around doing nasty stuff, and just this gray, godforsaken place that was just desert-like. And that's kind of what this was based on. So change the Silithid over to, like, World Eater Bugs, because we didn't really name them. And uh, that's kind of what's what's left of the world in this campaign. There's a small section of forest that is very, very carefully maintained. Um, there are caves throughout the mountains that surround the entire place. There's, you know, one city and a couple of settlements like way out in the desert, but there's not a lot left. It's just like the one, the one continent and, you know, a few miserable streets and an endless desert. That's, that's kind of it. So, Things are expensive. Water is precious, more so than gold. You know, things like lumber and stone, they are finite resources. So everything is kind of desperate, but it's been a thousand years. So this is, this is kind of the way they live their lives, so they don't really know any better. But they still have uh, a little bit of culture going on. So imagine like, like Agrabah or... or you know, Thebes, that kind of thing, where everything is handsome, golden stone, you know, painted designs, things like that. And sitting in the capital city, which we didn't name because it was just the capital, is a museum, a very large museum that holds artifacts from all across the history of... I don't know what that was. From all across the history of the world. And... In it is a man that's simply known as the curator. He catalogs and displays all these artifacts, these special scrolls, these books from an era of a bygone past that people have brought out of the desert to educate people on the way the world was and theorizes over, uh, you know, the round earth, the idea that there used to be much more than there was now. But of course, 
it's been a thousand years, so there's no real way to prove that. And why would their world change so radically, so suddenly? You know, the, the battle between the Ouroboros and the Tarisk has been long lost to the sands of time. But he's interested in uh, the mother goddess, who was Natishka, and her nine children, who were worshipped as demigods, whom, again, all of them are gone. So he wants to collect the pages of something called the Infinity Book, which we went over, the history of, of the uh, mother goddess leaving and the nine children trying to decide whom should uh, rule over the others. And Drode of the Shifting Time was the one who was left out of the nine. And we don't know what became of him because, again, he was perfectly mortal. But all of his other siblings were dead. So there's a lot of blank space for them in history because they don't have the pages that I described to you. Now, I would have sprinkled the Infinity Book into this campaign story, but then I would have had to like pick up a page at an awkward time, read it, toss it aside, pick up another page throughout this story, and that would have interrupted the flow, I think. So knowing what you do, if you've seen the episode before this, about the Infinity Book, that information, that story, is what this campaign is all about. They want, uh, or the curator wants, rather, uh, our heroes, which he gathers up on commission, to go out into the desert, into the various ruins of the nine gods, and look for pages of the original manuscript of the Infinity Book. Because, you know, books change, they get republished, they get lost to time, they get misconstrued, badly translated, etc., etc., uh, he wants them to go and just find old scrolls, find old manuscripts and tomes and things that might help explain, you know, the story of the nine children and the mother goddess. Like, he, he knows of them, so he has some information, but not a lot. He doesn't know what happened, and he wants to know because, again, the island is shrinking. You know, even if it's by a few centimeters every year, eventually they're going to sink into the abyss or what have you. The world is just going to keep shrinking and shrinking and shrinking until there's nothing left. Plus the, uh, the world eater uh, bugs that are crawling on the underbelly of the world are eating away at it. And it's going to be a hollow shell before long. And they're already standing on basically a big clod of rock and earth. And, you know, it's not going to go well. You know, it's been a thousand years and they're still there, but, you know, eras can come and go. Or, you know, there could be an earthquake and the whole thing could shake apart. So the curator thinks that if they gather the pages of the Infinity Book and find out what happened to Drode, that they will be able to um, figure out what to do about this. Perhaps save their world. And atop this, supposedly, in the Infinity Book written in like the margins are uh, uh, hints about the grand riddle of the goddess wheel. The goddess wheel, after which this campaign is named, is a big stone building. It's round. It's, it's like a coin, like sitting on the sand almost. It's, it's round and flat. And in it are over 900 rooms, just connected every which way, like a labyrinth. Uh, there's no traps, there's no monsters, well, none that, have, none that were placed there. There's no, nothing bad going on in there, but supposedly, if you go to the correct room and perform the correct ritual, you can talk to God, now, or, or in this case, the mother goddess. Now, whether that's true or not, whether she built the goddess wheel or had somebody else do it, if that was her platform to leave this world, it's not clear. But supposedly there's a metaphorical megaphone in there. If you go to the right room and cast the right spell, you can talk directly to Natishka. And, you know, to invite her gaze back onto this world, please come save us, is kind of the thing that, that uh, the curator is going for. Because somebody who wrote the Infinity Book, who was there for all these events... Uh, also wrote down how you can call mom and get her to come back and, and save everyone. So we've got to look for these pages and compile them 
learn the story and learn, you know, unlock the riddle of this massive stone building and, and how to work it. Because it's basically a giant telephone. It's a mechanism that just, you know, anyway, I'm talking in circles. Let's meet our heroes, shall we? When I started Goddess Wheel, I was like, gosh, it's been three or four campaigns, but this takes place almost, you know, a thousand years, 1200 years in the future. I can't bring in anybody that knows about the other campaigns because they'll have like meta knowledge. I need to bring in a completely different group of people um, for this because they can't know the history of this world. Because if they do, it kind of blows the whole the whole premise out. So I had to go and find uh, three completely new people in Gamers Guild that wanted to learn D&D and ran Goddess Wheel for them as their first campaign. So it was very interesting to be like teaching them and having them be like the next generation in this like long, convoluted, complicated storyline. So they didn't know about um, Wicked Master or Shadow of the Northern Plains or um, the Ouroboros Contract, thank God. Um, so they came in completely fresh as though they were denizens of this world, and the world has always been this way, according to their point of view. So I didn't have to worry about character knowledge versus player knowledge or anything like that. Um, so Goddess Wheel was designed simply uh, to, to teach them the mechanics, you know, how to fight, how to go shopping, how to equip your character, how to level up, stuff like that. This was a brand new batch of players. So... Uh, go fetch seemed like a good quest to start new people out on. So go collect the pages of the Infinity Book and bring them back to the curator for translation and so that we could read all the hints and riddles written in the margins to activate the goddess wheel. So we have uh, Raken, our fighter. We have uh, Gale, who is a druid. And we have Avaros, who is a shadow dancer. And a shadow dancer is basically like a super rogue. They can hide in plain sight. They can hide in shadows, um, like Naruto, like in the shadows. And they get a lot of extra opportunities for backstab. It's hard to affect them with mind magic and stuff like that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So he started as a rogue and became a shadow dancer. He, I think he was the only one that went into a prestige class. So we'll just call him shadow dancer. And, you know, the three of them, I only caught three at first. We did get a fourth person eventually, but we'll get to that. So uh, let's see. All three of which were human, uh, uh, relatively simple, you know, tan, this color skin. Think Again, think like Arabic or, or Agrabah, kind of like that, just tan white dudes or Arabic dudes, whatever you want to put it with that. Um, so just the three of them. And we introduced them to the curator, and they decided immediately that he needed to be Maximilian Pegasus from Yu-Gi-Oh. So as soon as they came in, How you doing there, Yugi boy? I had Reese's for breakfast. And they go, What? Pegasus had candy for breakfast? Not candy, Reese Puff cereal. And we went through this. That was like the joke of the campaign, is that the curator is Maximilian Pegasus. So I had to I had to learn how to do that voice over time, and uh, and like integrate it into this character because for some reason that was the voice they wanted. So, <laughs> um, and uh, we intro I introduced the idea of of artifact gathering for them. So if they're out in the desert and they find, like, an ancient artifact in the sands, they can bring it back to the curator and get, like, extra experience points. And I teach them about rolling 20s, about rolling 1s. I help them design their characters. Um, Rakan wanted to be the tank. Uh, Gale wanted to be DPS. And then Avaros wanted to be, like, the sneaky face rogue that could, that could backstab. Very, again, not complicated characters. These were first-time players. So they took pride in what they came up with, and I gave them a bunch of money to go shopping, because let's face it, shopping is one of the most fun parts of doing D&D &D in general, is opening all the books and looking at all the shiny shit that you can buy. <laughs> so I knew it would have to be like 
giving them a lot of money so they could go shopping, giving them XP, like, piecemeal, so they could, like, write that down and watch their characters grow. It wasn't going to be like, oh, you finished this chapter, go ahead and level up. You know, I actually wanted to start them with numbers so they could watch how it works. And, um... It went pretty well, I gotta say. It, it, you know, I know it doesn't sound like overly complicated or, or especially like new and shiny, the idea of, of go fetch the nine things and bring them back, and that's the campaign. And it did get repetitive, so I will cut out like, like I did with Shadow of the Northern Plains. I will cut out like travel time. And, and just like the little things, but I'll try to stick to the interesting events so that it sounds good, but I wanted them to have like the big like campaign experience without overwhelming them. So, you know, they went to the ruins and got the page and came back, you know, telling you that nine times wouldn't make for a very interesting story. So I'll stick to the good parts and you'll see kind of what these people were like as players, as people. So. Um, again, we introduced them to the museum, Maximilian Pegasus, the curator. We, we told them all about the world eaters, the Silithid, you know, so sue me. I thought the Silithid were the coolest damn thing ever at the time, because I'm a complete slave for Egyptian architecture, so Egyptian bugs from another dimension seemed like a really good idea at the time, so <laughs> we just called them world eaters, and, um... Or Langoliers, I guess, would be a good one. Uh, you know, time and space and gods have forsaken this world, so the Langoliers show up to eat the whole thing. It's just taking a while. But, um... And then I introduced them to the idea of fate checks. And, and much like in Shadow of the Northern Plains, I got a piece of paper and numbered it 1 to 100. You know, the bottom five were... Um, um, enemy, like, monster encounters. The top five were, like, extra treasures. You know, like, 37 was a rainy day. 34 was a traveling caravan. You know, 77, oh, you found a chest of gold in the desert sands. And, you know, things like that. Just, like, a hundred, not even a hundred things. A bunch of them were just blank. And I introduced something else called fate coins. Now, fate coins they could find after they beat bosses, after they collected infinity book pages, or if they rolled really high on their fate checks, they could find something called a fate coin. Fate coins were just a mechanic that I made up that uh, you could spend a fate coin, just hand it in. It was like a meta currency. It wasn't actually in their hands. And you could change the uh, list of 1 to 100 to whatever you want. So, like, say... Say number 53 is blank. You hand in a fate coin. You're like, well, I want number 53 to be, you know, a rainy day. Or I want that to be a chest of gold. Or I want that to be a bandit encounter. You know, stuff like that. I wanted them to have some control over their travel conditions. So they ended up filling a bunch of them with just, like, bags of gold and treasure chests. But... That's what players tend to do anyway. They didn't fill them all with monster encounters, so they only had like a 7 or 8% chance of running into monsters at all. Because the desert is vast, and the world eaters are many, but there's other stuff out there, as we'll soon see. So they get their quest from the curator, you know, go fetch, go check out all the ruins of the various nine gods, and uh, collect these pages, and, and, you know, we'll turn them in one by one so you can go shopping, you know, return to the capital with each page. Don't just go from ruin to ruin. You'll die. <laughs> and uh, he sends them off. So Rakin um, decided, he again, he wanted to be the tank. So as they're on their way out of the, uh, out of the museum, they see a shield on one of the displays, and they go, Curator, what, what is that? And they go, he goes, Well, Yugi boy, that would be the Eternal Shield. It is a shield that is completely unbreakable. And he goes, Can we borrow that? It's like it can't be touched by acid or fire or pressure. It's just an indestructible piece of metal. Can we borrow that? He goes, I suppose so. And so 
Rakan goes up and he yanks it off the wall. He's like, yes, eternal shield. You know, and I'm like, well, it doesn't make you invulnerable. It just means the shield itself can't be destroyed. So your arm will give out before the shield does, I promise you. So he's like, yeah, cool. First magic item. <laughs> And uh, Rakin was very proud of his, his armor class bonus. He, I think he was like a, a World of Warcraft player or something, so he really, really wanted to be the tank, just the untouchable armored guy. So imagine traveling across the desert in plate mail, and, and yeah, you know, it doesn't work especially well. So they stopped for, uh, what was it, you know, suntan lotion, decanters of endless water, uh, you know, turbans to cover their skin, uh, capes, cloaks to keep the sun off of them. Basically like an extra layer out over their armor to make sure, you know, this, that the sun would not be the death of them because it's desert out there. You're gonna die if you're not prepared. Uh, extreme environments in D&D &D are very unforgiving. Like, if if you just run across a desert, I think it's like 2d6 fire damage, like every 12 hours or something like that. I have the uh, the Sandstorm book, which is like D&D campaigns in the desert, and it describes all the horrible things that can happen to you if you go into a desert unprepared. So if you ever throw a campaign that takes place in a desert, make sure to remind your players about water, food, suntan lotion, you know extra coverings for all their stuff because you can't just kill them. It's not fair. Um, so I made sure to kind of get across to them that, you know, the desert is dry and dangerous and you will drop if you're not careful. So they stopped and bought all this stuff. They rubbed those sundan lotion, put it, put like the line on their noses like they're going on vacation. <laughs> they got the decanters of endless water and they played with the decanter for a while because decanters of endless water are just what they sound like. You can upturn it and it it has water forever. Or you can hold it and like prop yourself against a wall and speak a command word and it will shoot water like a geyser. The only thing is it can still knock you down and, and leave you prone. So you have to be very careful and like roll a high strength check or, or something to keep it from just like pushing you around like a fire hose. <laughs> But they each got one of those in case they got separated, I think they said. Really, one is all you would ever need. But they get three of them, and so they don't have to worry about water ever again. And they get suntan, the suntan lotion. I'm talking in circles again, sorry. They get all the things they need, and they head out. So the three men, they look at their map that the... Uh, the curator gave them, and they go, okay, well, where's, you know, let's try an easy one first. Where's the nearest one? And they look out, and it's like a week's journey from the capital, and it's Healer's Ruins. The, uh, the demigoddess who was in love with her brother and inhaled, like, all the poison on the breeze and died and turned into, like, green limestone and stuff like that. Kind of biblical when you think about it, but, um... They don't know any of this, and they, they book it for Healer's Ruins. And it takes them forever, because traveling across... And, and again, it's, it's, it was kind of like Shadow of the Northern Plains, but I was doing it, like, on purpose. Like, you, you need to realize the desert is vast. It takes a long time to cross it. It's not friendly terrain, and there are monsters and things out there. So, yeah... Even after harping on Shadow of the Northern Plains, I set up kind of a random battle system for a while to, to introduce them to the World Eater Bugs, to show them giant scorpions, to show them the occasional group of, of you know, ten bandits for them to cut down. And it takes them ages and ages to get across the desert. Uh, number one, to show how big it is and how dangerous it is, but number two to familiarize them with the fate checks for travel, to show them that it's not a friendly neighborhood. People don't leave the capital without a destination in mind, and usually it takes a very long time. So pretty much the first session was them just trying to get across the desert and arrive at Healer's Ruins. And when they get there, um, they do. They encounter... 
uh, some of the world eater bugs, basically giant scarabs. Now, Robert and I, uh, the guy that ran the Ouroboros campaign, sat one day and ordered like a bunch of, of pre-painted minis. So I had like the Hercules beetle and a bunch of like scarab swarm minis. I was very proud of my minis for this campaign because I'd gotten like 30 of them, all bugs. Just all different kinds of bugs, scarabs, praying mantises, beetle swarms, uh, just all different manner of, of insects from that era of D&D 3.5. And um, so they got to experience all, all the fun minis and the, uh, the hand-drawn map of, of the ruins and stuff like that. And... They start going through these things. It's like they're, again, slowly learning how combat works, how far you can shoot your bow, how far uh, your druid spells can reach. You know, what is the effect of this? What is the effect of that? So, it, again, it goes kind of slow because they have to keep flipping through books. Well, what does this ability do? Our druid, you know, what does this spell do? How far can I shoot it? Meanwhile, Rakin is having the time of his life because none of these bugs can get through his armor class. So he's sitting there, like, swinging his sword back and forth while the druid and the shadow dancer are, are doing, like, all their fancy abilities. He's just standing there with his shield. Ha 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 ha! You can't get through my armor! And just, like, bashing things over the head while these bugs are just boiling out in all directions because it's basically just a husk of a building and they're, they're intruding. Like, this is just a, a world-eater nest that's on the surface. So they clear out a bunch of bugs. They get a bunch of experience. They they gather, like, whatever unbroken shells they can. They're like, we could probably sell these. You know, this is, you know, a, a shell the size of a helmet. Somebody could make this into a helmet back at the Capitol. We could probably sell it to somebody. And they stuff that in their bags. And, you know, we do a little bit of, like, Monster Hunter. You know, you, you, you get antenna, and you get googly eyes, and you get uh, a polished, you know, silithid shell and, and things like this. And they stuff it all in their bags because they got a bag of holding, because, of course, they did. And um, they fight a couple of carrion crawlers. They fight giant scarabs. They fight the, the little swarms of scarabs. And uh, they, they basically just pick up, like, monster parts because... You know, monsters don't carry loot, so I had to have them drop something they could make money with. And they start exploring these ruins when the dust kind of settles. They, they down potions, because none of them know any healing spells. They down potions, and they start looking around, and uh, they see, like, the ancient remains of what used to be, like, a, an oasis garden. It's got sand in it now. There's stone paths that go up to this big... Like almost like a Capitol building. If if you look on the back of your your dollar bills, the the wide rectangular building with the dome in the middle, that's kind of what this place is is shaped like. But it's very like Egyptian. It's covered with hieroglyphs and pictographs and um, you know the ancient remains of of these gardens that have just been burned away by the sands of time. The overturned columns and you know some of the some of the walls are busted out from Previous battles are from burrowing world eaters or bandit bandit attacks, um, just trying to loot the place and things like that. So there's there's filth and crates and you know nobody's home. It doesn't look like at least at first. And they weave their way through this building. They they check this room. Oh, it's full of sand. They check this room. You know the ancient remains of a of a mattress and stone bed. You know. You know, they check this room. Well, that's an altar, and there's, you know, books have been eaten away by time and the elements. So, you know, maybe there's a vault. Maybe there's, like, a hidden room somewhere that's that's got, like, storage or something in it. And they run into a few more silithid, and they have to learn to basically, like, grit their teeth and stamp these things out because they don't stop. Not for a long time. They are everywhere. And, um... They're using the shell of this building basically to have like a vent to the to the nest or whatever without it being exposed to rain or other predators. So this is basically like an entrance to the the world eater colony. It's like if you go down there, you're probably gonna die. In fact, you will die. I guarantee it. So 
probably find whatever you're looking for and turn around and leave because if you stay here, it's probably not going to be good. And they go, well, are there any other buildings around here? Surely it's not just the one building. And I go, yeah, there's a, a, a citadel of, of, or not a citadel, a cit hmm, I forget. It's, it's like the, the street that leads to a circle of, of houses. I forget what they're called. Not synagogue. Cul-de-sac. God. There's the word of the day. Cul-de-sac. Of, of like small stone huts. And there's a big, a big uh, house on the end of the street. And they go, street. And I go, yeah, it's a, it's a stone street. And the winds, you know, pushing the sands back and forth. You can't see most of the street, but you can see like all the, all the remains of, you know, it probably were, you know, priests, worshippers. It's hard to tell. They, uh... They worshipped one of the nine demigods here, and this was probably the housing for all of them. Maybe that house on the end is like the high priestess or the high, the hierophant's place. You know, the, the leader's house is always bigger. <laughs> and they, they pass a well, and it actually still has water in it, so they like douse themselves with water to uh, get rid of the heat. And they go, okay, we're going to go explore the, uh, the high priest's... Um, house and see about that. And sure enough, some of the windows are still intact and the the door is is like double doors of stone. It's like, well, this place probably stood up a little better than the rest. And they they start like pushing on the doors and stuff. And they find that, you know, some of it's completely fallen away or collapsed in on itself, almost like a dollhouse, like one side of it is missing. And there's great big uh, sky skylights and just they look around and like, oh, maybe not. And they weave their way through this place because there's still like really nice furniture here that's just been saved from from time and weather because they're inside and the the windows, like I said, are still pretty much intact. So they're they're ruffling through like ancient cabinets and, and pulling open chests. Oh, you find you find 68 gold. You find, you know, a, a potion of bull strength, you know, showing them what a dungeon is and how it works. And here and there they find, like, small silithid that try to crawl up their legs and poison them. And they... Uh, uh, Rockin has to smack Gale over the back of the head so a bug doesn't, like, crawl up his back and, like, bite him on the back of the neck. He's like, ah, oh, hold still, Gale. Boom. <laughs> and knock him on his face. But um, as they are exploring, though, they hear a voice. Is someone there? It's a woman's voice. And they go, who's that? And they, was, was there supposed to be somebody here? I thought this was just ruins. So, you know, Rakin, like, pulls up his eternal shield, and they pull all their weapons and swords, like, is there some awful guardian here that we need to know about? And they turn the corner into, like, one of the great rooms, and they see this woman knelt among a carpet of golden gems. And they go, wow. And this woman is gorgeous. She's, you know, got the dark skin, the black hair, or the, sorry, red hair, green eyes. She's barely dressed. I mean, she's got like the see-through silk you might see on a prostitute. Um, she's got the gold like nipple sticker things that have jewels hanging on little chains down from them. She's got tiny, tiny underwear and not much else. You know, she's she looks pretty, pretty sexy, you gotta say. This was our fourth person coming in. Uh, this woman was named Catherine. Catherine was, I'm going to go ahead and say it, our hornball player's character. And now, I played a Spoonie, so I couldn't judge this guy, but he decided that he wanted to be like, like the party slut, I guess, and use sex as a weapon, use, uh, use high charisma. She was a sorceress, so she used charisma for her spells, but he also used it as an excuse to wander around mostly naked all the time. Just, you know, I, I, I could seduce that guy. No, don't. It's like, I could totally seduce any homophobe with that role and stuff like that, but we'll get to that. But basically, they find this woman sitting 
in a, in a dragon's hoard. And she's sitting there, again, just silk and, like, the two nipple things with jewels dangling off them and tiny, tiny underwear. She is gorgeous. And she's just sitting there looking meek and helpless. And we go, they go, who is that? And, you know, we introduce our fourth person. And she goes, I'm being held here by a dragon. He stole me from my traveling caravan and has kept me here because he finds me beautiful and I've been naught but his slave and concubine ever since. And I go, y you mean like courtesan? Because like concubine implies that the dragon is married. Shut up! <laughs> and um, as soon as we're starting to get introduced to ourselves, who comes home but a large black dragon? He just like boils in like he must have heard them talking or just arrived home from his hunt because he drops like a giant desert scorpion out of his fangs to one side. And, you know, who dares come into my lair and sift through my things? And he flares his wings wide open to block out the skylight and plunge them into darkness because his wings are so thick they're like leather. It's like you're immediately plunged into darkness and half light. He's so large that he barely fits into this room. And Catherine kind of like scuttles to one side because she doesn't have any weapons. She doesn't have her spell book. She doesn't really even have clothes at this point. So she kind of goes and hides in the corner. And, you know, all three of the guys are like, oh, we must save this woman from this dragon. You know, Power Rangers pose. Ha! And I start laughing because, you know, I didn't even tell them about that. And they go, Power Rangers pose. And I was like, <laughs> you're not the first people to do that. <laughs> So Rakin, Gale, and Avaros have to fight this black dragon. This, they're like, boss battle, yeah! And Rakin's running up with the eternal shield. Again, very high, very high armor class. Gets the claws across his arm and across the shield. It doesn't even leave grooves in the shield because it can't be damaged. Ha 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 ha! You can't get through my armor! And just like bashes the dragon across the nose. And then he gets a face full of acid for his trouble. He lifts the shield up and is like, well, your ass, your, you know, the acid would definitely melt through the shield. And, you know, uh, um, Rockin goes, I'm wielding the eternal shield. It cannot be destroyed by acid. Ha 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 ha. He's, he's really into it at this point that he's taking so much less damage because that's what he designed his character to do. And he's very enthusiastic for a new player. And uh, Gale is like throwing the, the exploding acorns and pulls like a saber. And uh, our, our rogue Avaros is trying to like maneuver around him to get the flank, to get the backstab. But the, the size difference and the size of the room, he like can't get behind him without like crawling up his tail. And that's not a good, jo that's not a good idea because if he decides to just like roll, he could get crushed for like 60 damage. So... They do this dragon fight in a very enclosed space with, with sword and exploding acorns and, and I think crossbow is what Avaros decide on. Avaros decide on. And uh, Catherine cowers in the corner for a while. And, and having our fourth players like, you know, can I find like a magic sword in, in the uh, dragon's horde or, or anything I can use as a weapon to join them and, and help? You know, I don't have any of my spells prepared. And how could I? He probably wouldn't let me. And you know, I've never had a player want to play, like, the helpless woman card, much less a dude. So it's it was kind of weird at first, but whatever. She's been held here for X amount of time to be this dragon sex toy. And we had to go explain that, that dragons are shapeshifters and blah -dee blah And that was the first character he ever came up with. I was like, okay, if that's how you want to play that, fine. But, um... This battle goes on for a long time, and they start the the dragon starts like spraying acid every which way in like straight line columns and putting holes in walls that not ought to have holes in them. And this place starts coming down, and they go, you know, it's all gonna come down. We've got to get out of here. And Rockin is like, no, we must rescue Catherine and and put this dragon down. Bah! He keeps swinging his sword back and forth. You can't get through my armor. Bah! He starts taking damage from, like, claws 
and like tail whips and stuff though, just things that would come from odd directions. And um, the dragon tries to cast like sleep on them, it doesn't work. He, the, the our druid starts like climbing up one of his legs, just trying to like stab him in the haunches and things like that. Avaros is putting arrows in his wings so that they can see, you know, the, the little specks of light start coming through uh, as they're filling him full of holes. And he, after a while, he starts to realize he's probably going to lose, so he turns to leave, and uh, Gale grabs him by the tail and, like, props himself against a, uh, a column and goes, you know, Rockin', finish him off! And Rockin's like, ah! He runs in there with his saber, swinging back and forth at his underbelly while he's trying to make his escape. And, you know, the organs spill out and blood goes everywhere and it finally flops over and dies. And they're like, huzzah, dragon dead, we did it. You know, I hack off his horn as a trophy. Oh, I hack off a claw as a trophy. <laughs> it's like, does anybody here have fletching? And I go, my God. You know, I showed them that the World Eater parts could be used for, uh, for selling things. But they have gone full on monster hunter at this point. They've got, you know, bladed weapons. They're trying to, like, scrape off scales and stuff to make this work. I was like, okay, you end up with, like, a bag of black dragon parts. Let's just call it that, okay? And we'll decide how much it's worth later and if you can make any any armor or items from it. And uh, we, we finally circle back around to Catherine, who's been, like, searching the dragon sword for a weapon or a wand or anything. And she found a wand of magic missile, or, or like, a wand of magic missile 2 or something. It's So it's, like... 2d4 plus 2, and, you know, it can't be dodged or blocked without the shield spell. So she, she, she had a little bit of time to pepper this dragon, but not before it just straight up got murdered. So she's standing there pretty much buck naked with, you know, this silken, you know, knot dress over her holding this wand. And the guys are all covered with blood and gore, and they, they turn around, Ah, oh, we have saved you. And she goes, you know, oh, my heroes. And she goes and runs to embrace our druid, who immediately freaks out. And this was really funny to me because, uh, you know, you know, like the beginning of the Predator movie where that one, the one uh, homophobic Marine guy is like, oh, you guys are a bunch of faggots. And that sense of camaraderie that goes back and forth from the, the playful homophobia between grown men that have seen combat together and stuff like that. In real life, our druid, who will remain nameless, we'll just call him Gale, Gale, in real life, was extremely homophobic. Like, to a fault. Like, when we took, like, group pictures and stuff together, and, you know, you put your arms around your buddies, and you grin, and you make faces... Gale did not even want, like, people's arms around him. He didn't like to be touched by other dudes, and it, we used to make fun of him for it, but um, Catherine runs straight for Gale, and, you know, the fact that Catherine's player is male makes him freak out. Like, oh, don't touch me. <laughs> you know, my hero, she, he, he leans over to, to hug him in real life. Oh, don't touch me. <laughs> so he's like, Oh, and he leans the other way and 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 hugs uh, Avaros, who is our um, our our rogue, and he goes, "Don't worry, I'll keep you safe." And so, <laughs> just to make the druid really uncomfortable, and I, I think he like he kissed our our uh, sorceress's forehead in real life, and just to, just to make our druid squirm, it was really funny. Uh, and and by then, you know, we were all really close friends, but. That was that was our druid's like personality flaw. IRL was that it made him so damn uncomfortable. But uh, we toned it down later. But our our sorceress being a dude playing a woman, uh, I don't know. Maybe it rubbed him the wrong way. But it was really funny to me. So they go outside. You know, once the dragon is is dead, they're like, well, we are covered with gore. There's a a well outside and they they find a bucket and they lower the bucket and they you know pour water over themselves pour water over themselves just trying to like scrub the scrub the gore and and scale bits off of themselves 
And they're like, well, we've got a whole freaking dragon's horde. And we go, do we share with Catherine? And they look at me, and I'm like, I don't know. I'm the narrator. You guys get to decide what you want to do. And they go, really? You don't make us split it like four ways? And I go, no. If one of you uh, can argue the others down, you can have one of you keep all the treasure for yourself. And our rogue opens his mouth, and the, other, the rest of the table goes, no. <laughs> we split it four ways. So everybody goes into this, into this dragon's horde room, and they kind of like shuffle the body, or what's left of it, to one side, and they start scooping gold, scooping gems, and, and random like magical things into their, um, into their bags of holding. And just like mounding it in. This was like, I wanted to show them this is what happens when you beat a dragon. There's a dragon's horde and you get to enjoy that money, you know. And uh, they would have perfect opportunity to go shopping later and, and enjoy that wealth. I wanted to have like a, a nice big paycheck when they first started. And so Catherine is doing much the same because she's been this dragon's slave and, and basically whore for X amount of time, and they go, Catherine, how did you come across, you know, such a, such a horrible dragon? And, and I go, you know, Catherine, fill them in on your, on your plot line or whatever you want, because uh, I don't know it. It's your character. And she goes, well, I was traveling from the western wood, you know, the last forest in the world, uh, and the dragon descended upon my caravan and, you know, took the, uh, the money cart, the, the cart that was full of chests of gold that we were going to use for trade, for, for new tools, new supplies, etc., etc., because, you know, it is a sacred thing, and uh, it is a sacred thing for we elves to grow as many trees as we can, even as the world shrinks around us. You know, we cut down the trees that have grown sick or tainted or died from being struck by lightning, and we, we trade out our gold for supplies to grow additional trees, and perhaps one day the forest will cover the greater expanse of the desert. But this dragon descended upon us, and it grabbed up the cart, and I was, you know, inside the cart at the time. And while he was pouring out all the gold pieces and ripping open the chests, I, of course, tumbled out of the cart as well, and he, he ate the two horses, and he decided to keep me. And they go, Catherine, that's awful. And they go, you know, where did you have clothes? What happened to all your stuff? And she goes, you know, the, the black dragon thought me beautiful and kept me in his hoard amongst all the finery. You know, and he, he, you know, did horrible things to me. And I was like, you know you're implying that you got raped by a dragon for months, right? And that's a serious topic. And he goes, yeah. And again, I had to go explain to everybody that dragons are shapeshifters and they can do what they want. But he kept her in this ruinous place and, you know, brought, you know, food. You know, the, he brought the giant scorpion to eat. He brought food. He brought whatever he wanted to keep this woman basically as a pet before these three guys came along and killed it. And she goes, you know, that is, that is kind of the story of my life right now. And I, I dare not uh, reach across the entire desert for, you know, I would drop of thirst and starvation before I reached the first settlement or the first trade route. So I was stranded here. And, of course, they feed her. They give her, like, a vest to cover her boobs. But they don't have any, they don't have, like, extra clothes or anything. So that was one of the things that they actually didn't get. So... I think it was Avaros who passed her, like, his, his, like, leather vest or whatever. And she wanders around basically, like, bottomless for a long time. And Avaros took a, uh, a huge hit to his armor class because he was only wearing half of his armor. So now she's got his chest plate and he's, you know, bare chested. So they're at a disadvantage now. So they, um... They stand there for a while. It's like, well, do we take you back to the forest? And she goes, no, I must repay you for, for saving my life. You know, whatever request you were upon is now mine to help you with. And they go, well, okay, but we're going to be doing a lot of traveling across the desert. Are you okay with that? You know, it's, it's not going to get any easier. 
if you were captured by a dragon, you could just as easily be captured by 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 monsters and torn apart or or bandits and and sold off as a slave or another dragon. If there's one dragon, there's bound to be more than one. Are you sure you're okay with this? They go, "My life is now yours to, you know, yours to command. I am you have saved me from a life of, of sexual servitude and probably being eaten one day when he got bored with me. You know, please take me along so that I might repay this debt. And, you know, they, they confer amongst themselves for a while. They, they know she's coming with them because it's the fourth player. But they confer for a while and they go, all right, but we have to, you know, you got to find some pants. We <laughs> And the player's like, oh, you mean I can't wander around naked? And so, yes, you can't wander around naked the whole time. You know, your armor class is like eight at this point. Or wearing that, that leather tunic thing, your armor class is like 11. You're going to get torn apart. And, she, and he goes, all right. And, you know, I have to explain to him about how armor interrupts spell casting and spell failure, stuff like that. So he elects to, like, buy, or, or she, sorry. Male player, female character, uh, Catherine elects to, like, buy a padded dress, basically, so that it won't interrupt or, or cause any sort of spell failure. But first, they have to get all the way back across the desert. And they realize the implication. They're like, wow, you know, this was the closest ruin, and it took us ages to get here. And it's like, well, at least we slayed a dragon and got all this money and loot and, and, you know, rescued this fair woman. And they go, Catherine, were there any, like, spell scroll tubes or, or ancient, like, tomes or anything here? We're looking for the, the nine pages of the Infinity Book. And they tell her all about this. And she goes, well, there's this cabinet off in the corner. You know, not everything valuable is made of shiny golden gems. Perhaps it is there. And they open the cabinet and they paw through it for a while. And these, these are ancient papers, so they have to be very careful. And they pull out the uh, different, like, spell scroll tubes. And they pass them to her because she can read them and actually cast the magic. So she ends up with, like, a lightning bolt, a, a fireball, a, you know, a, a rain spell, things like that. It's like, why did you use those on the dragon before? It's like, well, you think I could solo a dragon naked? Me neither. And they go, oh, yeah, okay. And eventually, the oldest of the old, covered with dust and grime and screwed airtight, believe it or not, is a spell is a spell scroll tube that has the first infinity page in it. And they take it out and they read it, and you already know what it says because I told you before. And they go, wow, okay, this is it. And so they roll it back up and they stick it back in the scroll tube tie it tight, and they, they throw it in their bags of holding along with all their other stuff, and they go, yeah, we're, we're doing good at this. On our way back to the capital. You know, we stop and rest for the night, obviously, you know, out of range of the uh, uh, ruins, because, you know, the world eaters may come up come darkness and try to eat the dragon's corpse. So it's like, did we get all? Did we get both horns? Did we get all the teeth we could get? You know, they tried to basically strip the body of anything that they thought could be valuable, and uh, none of them are Fletchers, but they got quite a bit. It was pretty nasty. So they they travel for a few hours to be away from the ruins, so that more world eaters don't come up out of the holes and and eat them in the dead of night. And they make camp and they sleep and they you know they put up a guard. Put up, I think, um, our fighter, Rockin, was was keeping watch while everybody slept. And they took shifts, and they set out the next day feeling pretty darn good about themselves. And then something awful happened. And I go, okay, you know, you guys are traveling. You're, you're halfway back. They've been rolling these fate checks uh, as they've been traveling. And they've been doing pretty good because most of the spaces on the uh, chart of one to, one to 100 are blank. So it's like a day of uninteresting travel and conversation, you know, which is all you can really ask for when you're traveling across dangerous terrain is that nothing happens. Um, they get about halfway back to the capital, and our, our fighter, Rakin, picks up the dice. is like, I roll for today's travel check, and he throws it, and it's a one. 
a one out of a hundred. And they go, uh-oh. And they look at me and they go, what is a one on the chart? It's like one, like two through six is supposed to be monsters. What's one? What's worse than monsters? And I reach over into my, my shoebox of minis and I go, it's a sand dragon. And they go, a sand dragon? And they go, yes, emerging up out of a, a mound of sand, for that is where he was hiding, waiting for you emerges a sand dragon. He's got golden, like, bronze and gold scales. He's got a big, whiskery beard and, and a long mane going from the top of his head to the tip of his tail. He's got curved, curved claws and a wide, lionish smile and glinting eyes. And then they go, we pull our weapons! And it's like, he's not gonna fuck with us. We just killed a dragon. And I go, yes but he's about four times the size of the dragon you just killed. And they go, he is. And they kind of look at each other, like even Rakan with his, his eternal shield is like, can we, can we take him? I don't, I don't know, I mean, <laughs> Catherine's naked, Avaros probably can't get through his scales, you know, Gale's got the exploding acorns, and Rockin might be able to tank him. Like, they're gauging him based on size, and rightly so, because this guy is monstrous. Like, in the upper age categories of, of sand dragons. And I go, he, uh, he approaches you like a wild salamander, just across the sand. You know, up a dune, down a dune, and right into your faces. And he goes, you have entered my territory, you poor foolish mortals. And he goes, it is 10,000 gold to cross my desert, or it is your lives. And Rakian is having none of this, because they just looted a dragon sword, and they don't even know if 10,000 gold is what they've got. So, he goes, you know, your horde or your life, and we'll fucking take you on. And the dragon reaches with like a fist, and just like, pounds the top of Rockin's head until he is up to his shoulders in the sand. And I go, you took, uh, and then I roll it, and I go, you took like 56 damage just now. And he goes, oh god! And I go, roll to make sure you don't die. Because, you know, catastrophic damage, you can just automatically die from shock. And he just makes the save. And he goes, any of the rest of you think you can take me on? And he, you know, he spreads his wings out and sends sand in all directions, and everybody gets like kissed by the sandstorm for two d6 worth of damage. And he goes, "I will destroy you all and take everything you have. Which do you think is better, a toll or your lives?" And he, you know, he threatens them down. And Catherine, Catherine is the first one to break. She goes, "Don't worry, you can have ten thousand gold." And she pulls her bag of holding and just like throws it on the ground in front of him, and of course it spills out with gold and gems. You know, 10,000 gold, take it. We'll, you Go in peace, great dragon. She's still traumatized from the last dragon she's been with, so <laughs> she throws the gold out immediately. She's very cowardly. Well, not, well, I guess not cowardly, but at least smart enough to know when they're outmatched. So she throws her... Uh, her share of the horde down, and the dragon takes it, and he goes, I'd best not catch you again. Every time I do, the price increases. And he burrows into the sand and is gone. And Gale is over trying to dig Rockin out of the sand, just trying to pull him. You know, he's in plate mail, and he got shoved into the sand. He's not going anywhere. And Rockin's like, God fucking damn it, I had him. I totally had him. He just had to bury me in sand. They're using their shovels trying to pry him out of the sand. This dragon is long gone with a great portion of their loot. So they mark that spot on the map. They're like, don't go here. Big mean sand dragon who can do 56 damage all at once. You know, we are not yet strong or powerful enough in magic items to take him on. And so he took off with their 10,000 gold worth of golden gems and they basically had to limp back to the capital. And they turned in their, um, their Infinity Book page. Now you doing there, Yugi boy? I had Reese's for breakfast. What? Pegasus had candy for breakfast? 
And Catherine's like, what is going on? Not candy, Reese Puff cereal. Shut up. <laughs> so, so we have to let this fourth person, this fourth player in on, on this, this joke. And she goes, okay. Uh, and we, we go, okay, so you've turned in the Infinity Book, you lost a portion of the Dragon's Hoard, so you can choose to redistribute it, or you can just say Catherine lost hers. And they go, no, we'll, we'll, we'll share, you know, what's left, and they end up, you know, it's a lot of money, it is. But I wanted them, again, to be able to shop and, and, and enjoy the joys of D&D, &D, you know, in each sequential step. So, you know, go to the place, go through the dungeon, slay the dragon, save the girl, take the horde, spend the horde, you know, all the fun things that, that are throughout a lot of campaigns. Uh, so they could kind of get a taste of what this tabletop game is like, and they are loving it. So the, the session kind of devolved. They started grabbing books like, oh, I could buy this weapon and this weapon and this weapon. You know, I could buy, you know, boots of speed. Oh, a belt of ogre strength. What is that? You know, oh, a, a staff of fireball. Yes. And they, <laughs> I, I watched their, their eyes light up like it's Christmas, and this is the greatest feeling ever, introducing these four people to D and D and what it's actually like to play it, and so, Rakan goes off with the the bag of dragon parts, and he goes. I go to like you know a, a synthesis or a, a magic item maker person, and see if anything can be made out of all this. And I go, Rakan. Well, you know, roll roll percentage, and I've got like a chart of things that these parts could make. And they go, you end up with the horn of the dragon. And they go, when you cut the dragon's horn off, uh, it made a nice vessel to make like a hunting horn. And he goes, really? A hunting horn? And he goes, yes. Whenever you blow this horn, you will summon a dragon. And he goes, why would I do that? And I go, not all dragons are evil. You can summon an ally dragon. And he goes, oh, okay. And they go, his name is Barlyle the Broad-Shouldered. He is a, what was he, bronze? I think a bronze dragon. He is fairly sizable and doesn't like being called very often. So you can only do it once per month. Uh, and, you know, it took them a week or two to get to the ruins and a week or two to get back. So once per trip is basically what he was saying. You know, Barlyle the Broad-Shouldered is, is fierce and powerful and very loyal, so treat him well as you would a friend. And he's like, yes, Eternal Shield and Dragon's Horn, I'm, I'm on it. And, and Gale, our druid, goes and he gets, you know, iron, iron wood armor and he gets like a new scimitar that does uh, a certain element of damage and, and Avaros you know, gets a new chest plate for himself and he gets like boots of sneaking and, and gloves of pick lock. And I show them the formula for like skill items. Like if you want a plus one to, to move silently boots, then it's this much. But if it's plus two, then it's this much. If it's plus three, it's this much. And they've got a dragon's horde. So he gets like a plus four pair of move silently boots. And you know, he, they're loving all the shopping. It's great. And I go, Catherine, what about you? You know, you've got the, uh, a portion of this dragon's horde, and, you know, you probably shouldn't wander the streets naked. It's not a good idea. Because, again, she's just got the barest see-through silks and, you know, no pants and is wearing Avaros's, uh vest, and that's about it. She's like, okay, well, I go and I get a regular set of clothes first, it uh, doesn't matter what they are, just to make sure I'm covered up so nobody takes advantage of me in the nearest alleyway. And she goes, I, I buy, you know, a nice padded dress so I'm at least A, covered, and B, have an armor of greater than 11. And then she goes and she buys potions and, and uh, scrolls and all kinds of stuff because sorcerers rely on raw emotion to cast their spells and stuff, but they still need to prepare spells per day. Some of them have somatic components, verbal components, physical components. So she goes and she buys like all the little ingredients and puts them in a pouch and gets like a, a purse, basically, to put them all in. So she gears herself out uh, uh, pretty well. 
And she goes, you know, I make sure I've got the plunging V-neck and all that good stuff to, to make sure I can still use all my feminine assets. And I, I uh, pay X amount of money to uh, make sure that my dress is good in diplomacy. And I go, diplomacy? And she goes, yeah, you know, seduction is based in diplomacy, isn't it? And I go, I guess, yeah. She, so she gets like a plus five dress of diplomacy, or, or we called it a dress of seduction, because that's what she was going to use it for. But um, a plus five diplomacy dress and spell components and potions. So our heroes gear themselves out as, as I was wanting them to, because shopping is one of the most fun things you can do in D&D. And they get back together and they go, okay, you know, what can we, uh, what can we do now? What can we... Is the uh, curator just going to send us out for the next the next page or so? And I go, well, the curator has two pages now. And they go, two? And he goes, yes, he has one page that, you know, so he would know about the Infinity Book. And you guys brought the second page. And he goes, oh, that was convenient. It could have been like the seventh page or the fifth page. And I go, shut up. Would you rather try to scramble them around? And they go, well, no, I guess not. They go, you brought the second page, and they, they picked them up because, I, I, like I said, I typed them out so they could actually read them. You know, well, we make a copy, so we've got a, like a, a, a copy of the, of the tale that we are gathering up. And they go, okay, do we learn anything about the goddess wheel? And uh, I go, no, not really. The only things that are written in the margins are, are various hints and things that don't really make any sense unless you gather all of them. And they go, oh, dang it. So, you know, we go to the nearest tavern for food, drink, and women, or in Catherine's case, men, and, you know, party the night away and stay in great rooms and stuff like that. So we'll set out for the next leg of our journey you know, when we, when we uh, come back for the next session. And I go, okay, so that is where we will call it for today. So things are going pretty well so far in Goddess Wheel, and I hope you enjoyed that story, and we'll get back to it next time. So I'll see you guys on the next D&D Stories. Keep gaming. Hey guys, thanks for watching. Be sure to hit that like button for me. If you want to keep up with channel updates, check me out on Facebook. And if you're feeling especially generous, be sure to visit my Patreon. Keep gaming!